on the back, some blanks on the back. If you have prayer requests you would like to share with us, or just something that you'd like to convey to let us know and to give us an update. And some announcements today. A uh, Nazarene missions trip is being planned for July 11th through 18th of 2024. Participants will be going to, to Panama. The estimated cost of the trip is $2,000 and a $100 deposit is due by August 20th. Uh, for more information, contact Teresa Carter back here. Um, information was included in the August newsletter as well. I forgot to say one thing about the connection card. Uh, you can drop it in the uh, basket as we as we pass around offering baskets later on. So, um, our next prayer service. Can we get a round of applause for prayer service? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Our next prayer service is coming up on August 27th at 6 p.m. Please make plans to attend and send any prayer requests to Pastor Margie. She's preaching today at the um, assisted living facility. And by the way, I have my beautiful assistant here today who's going to be helping me with a little bit uh, today. We're teaching about uh, servanthood, you know. Fisher's Point will be having a dine to donate at City Barbecue on August 28th from 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. Proceeds will be added to our building fund. So, and we're excited. Six o'clock is when we would love to have a church yeah. get together at yeah. 6 p.m. I know our Sunday school class is gonna do it at 6 p.m. But um, they don't do it on Sunday, so that's why we had to choose Monday. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. And we love City Barbecue. They, they always treat us real well. I think they give us, what, the 20%? 20, 20%. 20 so 20% of the proceeds. We will continue to collect items for school pal packs throughout August. School pal packs provide students in Nazarene primary schools with supplies they need to facilitate learning. And bags and business cards listing the exact items needed are on the table as you hit, exit and or enter the foyer. And if you have any questions, also contact Teresa Carter. And we have one more announcement here. Alabaster Sunday is coming up on September 10th. If you don't already have a box to build our extras on the table in the foyer. Right. Mm -hmm. If you please stand with us today. Mm -hmm. 
Let's start with a word of prayer. Father God, we are so grateful for you. Today we live in worship out of gratitude. And today we ask that you speak to us. Help us to feel your presence. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. I greet you this morning in the name of the Father, His Son, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit who draws us and quickens our heart to worship. When we think about the gathering that we have every week, it's tough to know. For some of you, you've never known better days spiritually, right? You're at the top of the mountain. For others of you, you're just hanging out. The beauty of coming together as a church as we teach the verities and the truth of Scripture that point us to the one that we worship today. And we're going to start out singing a song, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, talking about the great attributes of our God. It really comes from you as you hear these words and sing them. They may uh, trigger a reminder to you because they come out of a verse that comes out of 1 Timothy 1.17. It says, Now to the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, to God who was alone wise, be honored glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's go ahead and join our voices and sing. Oh, 
This morning, singing this song, immortal, invisible, God only wise, all those attributes telling us how God is so different from us. And yet, we know that's not the whole story. The story is that, regardless of where we're at in life, we also have this wonderful friend, Jesus, a friend of sinners like us. And we want to sing about that today. Oh, 
much we wish we had known, we knew when we became Christ, what we know now. And some of us, we came to Christ through his gentle calling to us, but through our life we proved to, to be the one who saves and helps and keeps and loves. And we're living out the fact that he's going to be with us through the end. Let's go ahead and sing it. just the voices here on this list. depending on who you're talking to and what kind of poll you're doing. Loneliness can have some incredible, incredibly severe physical, mental, and emotional effects. But why? Because, um, because whenever you're alone, um, the devil attacks. Right? There is a huge difference between isolation and solitude. I want us to remember that today. You, you can approach someone on the street who doesn't necessarily disagree with Jesus, and they'll say to you something like, well, I don't go to church, or I don't, I don't really subscribe to all that because the people there, they're hypocrites. And I'm like, well, yeah, you're, you're probably right about that, but do you go to the grocery store? You know, do you go, do you go anywhere to the gas station? because those places are also filled with hypocrites. But unless we realize that God's word and fellowship and, and understanding who he is through not only his word, but other, other people as well, and how we learn to help people along in their, in their process. And also we grow Whenever we're, we deal with people who might not have the same personality as we do, or something of that nature, right? Yeah. Iron sharpens iron, right, Dale? Dale, do you have any other things to say about loneliness? You sound really wise. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Dale. <laughs> Dale uh, would see people every day. Sean sees people every day who are dealing with chronic loneliness. So why am I talking about this today? This is, one of the reasons I'm talking about this today is because we in church often don't talk about it. How can we be lonely when social media connects us with every living human being on the planet, right? But that's the genius in the evil. Because, because this epidemic is actually hidden because it's not right out there in plain sight. Hey, I can connect with anybody anytime. I can say what's on my mind, either anonymously or you can see my, at least my name, 
you know where it's coming from, but at the same time, there, as much as we can connect now through technology, we are more lonely than ever. Because what we've realized in the past and in the recent past is that when we thought uh, the opposite of loneliness would come from, or the antidote from loneliness was making myself heard, what we realize now is that actually the antidote is making myself known. I, we all, whether we're introverted or extroverted, want to be known. Yes. We want someone to understand us. We want someone to feel what we feel and maybe put our, their hand on our back, or whether it be figuratively or, or, or really, whenever we're dealing with grief and injustice and things that we're going through. We want people to understand and nod their head and say, even though they don't fully understand, if we're going through something very difficult that they could not possibly understand, we at least want someone in the room to hear us say something out loud right. to the effect I've heard it. Right? But then there's the, there's the isolation that gets us. The isolation that comes with saying, like, I want to expel everyone around me because if I do that, I'm going to feel better because I'm the only one I can trust. I'm the only one who loves me. I'm the only one who can deal with what I, what I deal with. I'm the only one who can deal with my own flaws, by the way. I'm the only one who knows how this all should work. And then what we find ourselves, what we find is we become more bitter, more angry, more calloused. But then there's solitude. There's the other, there's the good side of this. If we choose to have times away, we choose to pour, allow God and scripture to pour into us, we take those times away because we want to be away from distraction. I would argue that someone who is an introvert, who is incredibly dedicated to Jesus, they take times away for solitude, not isolation. Now, could we easily slip into isolation? Of course. Of course we can. We're a little bit more prone to it. Well, I wanted to lay that as a foundation really quick. It's going to sound a lot psychologist. I'm not, I guess I'm kind of a psychologist, but I'm not as much as a you know, clinical counselor or something. But, but I want to propose this question to you. Do you think if you were to take a time machine back in ancient times, that you would have chosen the position of prophet if you would have gone and taken your resume to the nearest workforce development center. Would you have would you have chosen that? Because hey, you, you've got to have a glamorous life, right? A, a lot of the times in ancient times in, in scripture, in, in scriptural times, you know, they would really lift up the prophet, you know. They might get a nice house, maybe they might not. But they were revered in some ways. But might I remind you, sometimes if they didn't say the right thing, they were hated. The prophets were loved if they said, God is going to bless us and we're going to have prosperity and the next seven years is just going to be outstanding. We see that in before the Egyptian tyranny. If I was a prophet today, and I would argue that there are some aspects of my job that are prophetic in nature. And let's not think of prophetic as in like fortune telling or something. See, if you think about it this way, a prophet is, is the person who represents uh, God to the people. And a, and a high priest or a priest back then is, a, is the person who represents the people to God. It's an easy way to remember it. So the prophet would come and he would say, um, hey, listen, God has told me something and you're going to love it. We're going to have seven years of, of great, incredible harvest and, and everything's going to be prosperous. No one's going to attack you on, on any borders, north, south, east, or west. And it's going to be wonderful. But that same prophet would have those times where God would say, oh, i got a hard one for you. Can you go and tell these people over here they need to repent because they have completely fallen away from me? They're starting to kill each other. They're starting to sacrifice their babies. 
Can you go tell those people, by the way, can you just walk into their front door and just say, hey, stop it because God's going to punish you if you don't, right? Do you think that you would have liked to have been a prophet in that context? I don't think so. It's great to be a prophet when everything's going well. It's not so great to be a prophet when things are not going so well. They have to be the truth tellers. And when Israel was in the midst of kind of having one foot in worshiping the one true God and one foot in pagan ideology, the prophet had to stand there and say, hey, slap them upside the head figuratively and say, stop it. Would you stop it? Yeah. Just stop it. And I would not have liked to have been that prophet. Right. I want to be the prophet that's coming down the middle of the road and there's parties and parades and all those things. Hey, what is that? If my name was Isaiah, for instance, which we'll be reading from. Hey, look, it's Isaiah, everyone. Let's throw a party. He's probably going to tell us something great. Well, the fact was, Isaiah was in this context, and we're going to read from chapter 41 today. Isaiah was in this context where it wasn't such a great time because Israel was divided. And, you know, family members, tribe members, they, you either represented the north or the south. And they thought differently, and they, and they did different things in their worship, and, and they celebrated the festival slightly differently, and, and there was just a whole lot of infighting, and, and finally, what happened was exile. God says you can't play well together. You start dabbling your foot over here in pagan idolatry, and you also are, are saying that you worship me. I'm going to bring in a new nation to scatter you all, all over the place. So the exile, one of the exiles was happening at this time. So it was a divided kingdom to start with, and then exile. Very interesting. So you can imagine if, if God has promised you this promised land, that's what they call the promised land, because God promised it, and then all of a sudden, you're enjoying the fruits of your labor, enjoying the fruit of what God has given you, and then God steps in and says, oh, you're going to have to move away for a little while. And someone else is going to take care of this area. And someone else is going to rule over you. The first thing, I, as an Israelite, I'm just going to put myself in their shoes, the first thing I would have thought was, God, you're supposed to be the one that's ruling us. Why would you let anybody else rule us? And God says, why didn't you let me in the first place? From God's perspective, it was no different than an Israelite ruling versus a Babylonian. Or an Assyrian. Or a Persian. Because God, at the very beginning, said that he wanted to be the one to rule over their lives. Right. So who cares who's in charge when it comes to the flesh? He wants to be the ruler of them. Also, oh, now Israelites complaining. They're all complaining about the fact that, oh God, you're not in control. And I can just imagine, and I'm very much putting this context in, into the story, that God was looking at them and says, why did you ever take me off the throne in the first place? Well, I'm going to back up from that subject for a second and just say that, can you imagine that Isaiah had to bring a very truthful, hard message to these people? Like, you need to turn back to him. I know everything looks completely discouraging. I, I completely understand what you're seeing. I completely understand what you're going through. And by the way, God is the only one who can legally say that, that he understands what we're going through, right? Amen. So, so he, you know, we're going through all of this, and Isaiah has to be brought in front of these people to say, well, you guys got to turn back to him. They don't want to hear that. They want to hear steps to get our stuff back. 
You've got to turn back to him. And Isaiah, I can only imagine, was feeling the most loneliest and low you could ever feel. God was speaking to him. Why did he seem so silent to everyone else? God, why can't you tell people how all this? And God says, I am, and you're helping me. So, as we transition through the book of Isaiah, we're seeing kind of the ups and the downs. We're, we're seeing the discouragement, the lows. But then we come to chapter 41, where, you know, the, the switch has been taken off the tree. The Israelites have been spanked a little bit, you know, and, and disciplined. And, and they're kind of hurting. And, and, they're, and they're kind of writhing. And, and they're, they're emotionally spent. And then we come to 41, chapter 41 of Isaiah, where now Isaiah gets to say, yes, I've told you all these truths that are very hard to hear, and we're going to need to get our act together. But here's the other part of it. God is our helper. He has not for, forgotten about us. He has not forsaken us. There's not one point in time during this time where God was like, oh, that's right, I had an appointment with Israel. I completely forgot. Not once. So we're, we're in Isaiah chapter 41. It'll be up on the screen here. And starting with verse, uh, I believe now, yes. Yeah. And this is what the Lord says through Isaiah to the people. I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners. I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. If I were an Israelite back then, I would have looked at the circumstances, the resources, the realities right in front of me, and I would have said, you know, it's time to walk away. It's time to give up. It's time to just kind of let it all go. Not necessarily because God, I feel like God has abandoned me, but because I've messed it up. There are so many people out there, I will say, and I'll just put this as a little side note to something I said earlier, and there are so many people that have isolated themselves from, from fellowship and the rest of the world, not because they feel like God is not with them, but because they feel like they are too broken, they are too dirty for anyone ever to know. Right? Right. God is still good. He's on the throne. I love him. I read my scripture. I pray. But everyone else will reject me. They will hate me if they only knew what I've done and what I've said and what I've thought. No one could possibly accept me for who I am. But the most amazing thing about the God that we serve is that, okay, I'm going to put this in a way that might sound weird. He doesn't accept us for who we are. He accepts us for who we are supposed to be and who he can make us to be. And he accepts us right now so that he can transform us. Does that make sense? So, so don't hear me saying like God doesn't accept you because he does. But God sees you just as you are. He embraces you. He takes you. He holds you close to himself because in, in the midst of all of this, he knows that your life is going to change. Yeah. He sees things in you that you could po not possibly see in yourself. We, we tend to think that we're absolute experts on ourselves, right? Well, I know what I, what I think and what I feel and why I feel it and, that, and all that kind of things. And I can tell you from, from the perspective of of a counselor, perhaps. A counselor might say, there's a lot of people out there who have no idea anything about themselves whatsoever. 
But God knows us through and through. He holds us close. And he loves us despite who we are in the moment. Amen. He knows that he can look at you and say, this is not who you are. So don't hear me saying that God doesn't accept us. Please don't hear me saying that. Because he does. So here is Israel. And if I'm going to put Israel and just combine them into one person with one personality, God is speaking to this Israel. And he is saying, no matter what you've done, no matter how, how, you've, how, how you've handled the situations that I've thrown at you in the past, I know who you are supposed to be and who I could possibly make you to be. And, and we see evidence of this starting in verse 9. We say, I took you from the ends of the earth, so he knows you. From its farthest corners I called you. So he's talking about gathering his people. He, I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So what's our, what's, what's our skin in the game? All right? We can't just sit back and say, God, I'm just going to do all of these things on my behalf. He implores us that we are not to fear. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And who can say anything better than that? Right, very the world is going to throw a lot of trash at our in our direction. The world's already thrown a lot of trash in our direction. Our circumstances, our, our weaknesses, even sometimes our strengths can, can make us prideful and haughty and all of that. Sometimes I think the devil loves when we're really good at something. Because that can easily become an idol. Look how good I am. Hey, here's something I can get glory for. But sometimes we do feel that loneliness. We feel like we're, we're so far remote. We're, we're so far away from God intervening. And what God is telling us through this moment is that even if you don't feel me, even if you don't, like, you know, whenever you a really good worship service, you feel that the hair on the back of your neck. Well, I have hair anyway. You know, the back, the back of your neck. You know, like, oh, God is here. And God is saying that even if you don't feel that, he is here. He's with you. Do not fear. I used to tell my son something, and I want you to hear this from a, path, a parent's heart, okay? And uh, I want to make sure that we understand that at the time, his little sister was very young, and sometimes young children can say and do things that might be abrasive to the older Child, right? Um, so he said, oh, Dad, I'm so upset. I'm so upset. She did this. She said that she won't quit judging my stuff. You know, she, you know, it's just a poking, you know. So I said this to him, and I said this to others. I said, think about it as the eagle and the ant. He's like, what? Eagle and the ant? Said, yes. Does an, does an ant... And I'm not calling her an ant. I'm just saying, think about personality, think about the things that you're, you're worried about or that you're angry about can seem so small. Does the eagle care what the ant is doing? If the eagle flies high, the ant has, has no access. So I was trying to give him that idea when, he, when he's also thinking about bullying, uh, when he's thinking about those kind of things and, and hard things that he's going through. Think about it's time to fly high above it. Right. I'm not calling my daughter an aunt. <laughs> One of the things that I think that we forget about is the massive size and power of God versus what we're going through. Now, does that make it less, less difficult? No. 
but it does show us who's going to win every time. Not even the same ballpark. As, as Pastor Weishart said last, last week, the devil can't be in every single place at the same time, but our God can. Amen. So the devil will send one of his minions, you know, instead of himself. What is it you're fearing today that you feel like God has not has not um, come through on, maybe? Do you think that he's looking at you and, and talking with you and saying, no, I, I can't handle that, I'm sorry. I think God knows how we feel, what we're going through, why we're reacting the way that we are. And as much as the devil wants to push us to the outskirts so that we're isolated from everyone, so that we're not strengthened by fellowship and by everyone around us, he wants us to be a part of that epidemic of loneliness and a statistic, God is saying, no, I, I want to draw you closer. Have you ever noticed that everything that the devil has to do with is pushing out, pushing away, and everything that God has to do with is bringing closer? It's interesting. Because even look at it from the New Testament perspective. If, if a leper were there on the side of the, of the street, oh, keep my distance. But what did Jesus do whenever he came down the middle of the street? He cares about us. Right. And there are some times where we even push people away because we feel like, this is, the, this is the classic one, we feel like what we're going through and what we're feeling should not be validated. Should not be valid, right? Like, oh, it's, it's too... I'm just going to say this as part of my stronger language. It's too stupid for anyone to care. Like, this is too small for God to care about. Or sometimes we say it's too big for God to care about. Like, what? Pick one, please. You know. But He cares for us. So we're going through in, in, in Isaiah chapter 41, we're seeing two separate sides of the loneliness. Number one, Isaiah obviously is going through it because he, he is he, he's the only lone messenger with a very difficult message. And then Israel's kind of going through it, right? They don't have a place of their own anymore. Everyone else in the regions around them think that they're crazy for following this God. A lot of the things they were doing were countercultural to the greater culture. Some people might have said that they're not culturally relevant. But God is wanting to set them apart. Not set them remote, but set them apart. He cares for them. He wants them to not fear because he has it under control. And this last piece, I want to read one more time, because this is a promise. Like, I'm not advocating going out and getting a tattoo, but if you did, <laughs> just saying, I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What a promise. Yeah. That doesn't get you fired up. As my mom said last week, you would know it. Yeah. <laughs> so we must, if we want, if we're wanting to tap into the strength, to the power, to the mercy, to the grace, to the transformation that created the universe, we have to lean on Him because that's where the source is. And another thing, if we're called by Christ and we are, are um, 
people who ascribe to his name, how are we helping people to overcome this epidemic as well? I've, I've talked about this one, one thing here a few times, but I think it, it really applies here. And that's when the idea of when someone has lost a loved one. And the Jews have this really interesting... Has anyone ever heard this? Or sitting Shiva? I can't remember how you pronounce it. You, if you're participating in this, you are not a Bible scholar. You are not some ordained high priest. You are simply a person that walks into a home of someone who has just lost a loved one and you literally sit there quietly. That's it. It's that ministry of presence that we often read about in Henry Nowen. Um, if you've ever read any of his books, if you've not, please read them. If you, if you have, you know what I'm talking about. It's this ministry of presence that allows someone who who can barely see you because of the tears in their eyes, but they can see you across the room. You don't have any answers, but you're there. Man, can you believe how incredibly powerful that is? Oh, what, what about if you're a person that's there even when someone is recovering from a sinful choice that they made? You're there. The devil wants us to put them away and say, well, you know, you're not close enough to Christ for me to care about you. I'm going to go over here. Oh, that's that's dark. That's real dark. I, hope, I know none of, none of us have said anything like that or thought anything similar to that. The decisions they've made, let's just call it like it is, but we're still sitting there saying, I love you and I'm going to love you through this. I'm going to help you to change and transform and get you the resources that you need and tell you about the Jesus I love who took me through something of my own. All right. Yeah. How powerful is that? Because they're already thinking, no one will ever accept me because of this. I did this, and I did this, and then I did it again, even though after I saw that it was a bad idea. But you, but you were still there. Ah, because I'm the representation of Jesus in your life, and Jesus is always there. Yeah. That's powerful. You know, some of us are, have probably dealt with loneliness or whatever we've dealt with. And we as a church need to be aware of that. I'm not saying stand up and say, hey, it's me. No, no, I'm not saying that. But we need to be aware that that is a thing. People are being, are falling away from the Lord left and right because they feel like no one cares about them. No one hears them. And no, we, we deal with our own stuff, right? Yeah. Sure. Of course. Sometimes we have to bandage our wounds before we can, you know, or you know, take the oxygen mask before we can hand it on. But I just wonder if, if maybe some of you need to, to really pray about strengthening your resolve in this area. If, if, if perhaps you need to pray about God coming and transforming you in this area. And, that, and perhaps asking God if you can be a light to those who are living in darkness. Right. I'm going to call Dave and, and Pastor Jess up here. And if you would like to pray today, the altars are open. That means the edge of the stage here is all. Let's be aware that God cares about us and he cares about our needs. So we're going to sing. If you'd like to come down, you're welcome to do so. We open the service by asking the Holy Spirit to join us in this place, to quicken our hearts to worship as we respond today. We're going to sing a song. It's really a prayer. Jesus, 
open and close. And our worship is defined by our obedience. So let's sing this together.
His Spirit through you teach. That is what we need to know because mm -hmm. Isaiah 41 is my favorite. Mm -hmm. And I have been going through it. And I've been in solitude, praise the Lord. <laughs> but I did it for my eye. Terry, mm -hmm. my retina, I did it though. I wasn't going to go to the doctor. But my sinuses have been horrible. They're just, and leading up to that, I just have to tell you. My factor, you know, was taken away because it was needed to be fixed. I my toes down, I'm a farmer, I'm a little small, little small farmer. My toes gone, my cat is gone. Uh, my car get down these rotors, I squeaked up here. <laughs> and yes, I squeak and I keep moving. And all I can say is, I never let the devil go. You know what? I can't use it anyway because I can't drive the dog on track. <laughs> When it, when it comes to my eye, it's not cut, I can't do it very easy. But my sinus passages are so bad. I went to see, I've been waiting for six months to see this EMT, which I saw her on last Monday. I scheduled her on 9 11, yes, 9 11 for sinus surgery. And I, I hope to sit in this congregation and just see without coughing or blowing my nose or can't blow my nose. God is working good. Everything for my good. I thank you for your prayers, you guys. I found them and I, I'm healed. I cannot believe what I've experienced through all of this. But one thing to the other, and he's like, nothing stops. Everything is breaking right down. No, it's, I got that really bad sinus infection. I cough so hard. And I thought, Maybe I'm not, not going to go to the doctor because maybe it's, you know, you just, maybe it's something that go away. Mm -hmm. This is a slight blinking, and you see, I can see a little light. I wasn't going to go. I thought, the mind is it, is it lightning out there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Long story short, that was the trick. That was the alarming sound. And from one point to the other, it was done. I didn't, I, I have not felt any pain. I didn't even know what he did. I, I see the light, but I see, I guess, Lord, thank you. I just Amen. thank you. And the size surgery I've had before, I've got polyps. And it's to the point where I guess the Dr. Boone said that sometimes when they, you know, get full, they have no place to go. They start infiltrating this bone in your sciences. So she said, it's time. It's time to just get it done. So what y'all are praying for me? I already know the Lord has led me on this just restoration. And I just put it, chilling. I have every card that you have sent me. And I kid you not, I look at them all the time. And they just come as to me. They give me the support that I need at my church and prayers. I know that they all come for good. And I just feel I'm on the right. Well, I'm going to be coming. I'm going to be able to live the life that the Lord wants me to live. Breathing through a <laughs> That I'm supposed to be doing. And not go through just sex. It's just annoying. It's just miserable at times. But I thank the Lord all the time. I'm thankful that all my equipment comes back. I'll be ready to use it. <laughs> thank you, guys. Amen. Amen. Very good. On that note of God's faithfulness, think about the way God has been faithful in your life. And go forth. Be joyful this week. Serve the Lord. We'll see you next week. Amen. Amen.